and welcome back to our study, A Tale of Two Crowns, the gospel story throughout the scriptures. We have been taking a journey to the cross in a way that we have never done before. I said that Jesus used only the Old Testament to tell all of his disciples who he was, both while he was alive and then after he was resurrected with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We'll talk about that next week in our last lesson in this series, but today we're going to take a walk to the cross, and I hope that the Word of God will come alive to you in a way that you have never experienced it before. Today, our third lesson, a passionate story, is the passion of the cross. The cross refocused for us in a new and living way. We have been visiting the vistas of scripture for a fresh vision of Christ, seeing the word in new eyes, panoramic pictures and the power of story as the Old Testament gives us snapshots of the story of the gospel throughout. And we have been saying that a picture is worth a thousand, wor uh, a thousand words and a moving picture worth even more. But what if you were the one who had to portray Christ in a movie that would move others to come to know him? And then using scripture and prayer, you sought to know from him what he felt, what he thought, what he experienced, and why. What if you had to capture the motivation that compelled him toward the cross? That was the experience of this one man. His name is Bruce Marciano. And when a Christian film company wanted to make a movie of the life of Christ, they were looking for a Christian actor to fill that role. Bruce would tell you that he would have considered himself a back row Christian, a nominal Christian at that time, not even knowing the things that he was going to portray. And so for the first time in his life, he dug in to know Christ in a way that he had never known him before. And he says that he got a life-changing view of Jesus. As he searched for ways that he could come to know him in his own life as well as represent him, as the Lamb of God. He wrote this book called In the Footsteps of Jesus and is one of the most amazing books I have ever written about the story of the making of this film. It's compelling, it's powerful, it's joyous, it's poignant because when he beheld the Lamb, everything looked different for Bruce and certainly for us as we had the opportunity to behold the Lamb in this great uh, story that is retold. Bruce went to Morocco, this town of Warsasat is where they taped the life of Christ, particularly the last moments of Christ's life and particularly the cross. They used extras for filming from the area. They were always waiting for Jesus to show up. The first time that Bruce was in character and came out of his hotel room as Jesus, the town came out to welcome <laughs> Jesus. And when they were approaching the time when he would climb Calvary and go to the cross. He and a producer who was given to him for the express purpose of reading scripture and praying over him before every scene. He and this man went to the place where the crosses had already been raised the day before. They wanted to pray on site before the day that they filmed the crucifixion. And he and his producer stumbled up the hill and what they saw on the other side when they got to the three crosses completely took their breath away. For there were a number, dozens of Moroccans who had gathered sitting there before the three crosses. Nobody saying a word, just sitting and staring. And the producer looked at Bruce Marciano and said, they're gathering at the cross. They're gathering at the cross. And today it's my dream that you and I would gather at the cross. We have been saying for weeks now that as the Lord has unfolded his word for us, that wonder awaits. It's the phrase the Lord gave me as I studied the very first week, that if we would do this together, wonder would await, and boy has it. But today I want us to come from an even more poignant perspective than this. More than the wonder of the word, I pray we will see together, like Bruce Marciano, the wonder of the word made flesh, who dwelt with us, who came and died, who is determined to the end. And so I have chosen a theme verse for this message taken from John 13, 1. I want you to look at it with me. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own, 
who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Do you know that when Bruce Marciano was looking for the motivation of how to portray Jesus, the overarching word that the Lord gave him was joy, that Jesus was a man of joy, and that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sitting at the right hand of the throne on high. But I can say beyond even the joy of Jesus, the love of Jesus compelled him, not only to come to this earth, but compelled him in every single thing that he did. And if you get the opportunity to watch The Gospel According to St. Matthew, which is the movie I'm speaking of, it's one of the top five Christian movies ever made. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to see it. You will see a more joyful, more loving, more touchable Jesus than you have ever seen before. And it reminds me of this, the full extent of his love. What if today you could come to the cross and sit just as those Moroccans, many of whom didn't even know Christ, but were compelled to come to the cross? What if you could gather there with me today? What if you could climb that hill again and sit and see the Savior of the old, old story in a whole new way? That's what I pray we will experience as we come to this place and as we hear and see a love that is beyond anything we could ever dream of. Would you pray that with me right now? Father, I thank you that you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I thank you that you created and rule the universe. I thank you that you had every reason in the world to turn your back on us when we turned our back on you and yet you did not. You came, you walked among us, you became a dwelling full of love and joy and compassion and comfort and truth. And Father, I pray that as we gather at the cross today, we will see all of that and so much more. And beyond that, we will be reminded that you are, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to you, comes to the Father, comes to the joy of heaven without sitting at this cross and worshiping the one who gave his all for us. Father, open our eyes that we may see the Lamb of God in a whole new way, and seeing the Lamb, that we would live. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take your handouts with me, and I want us to see together today three things about the Lamb of God that have taken my breath away as I think again of all that he did on the cross. The first thing I want to remind us of is that he was the willing lamb. The willing lamb. Look at John 10, 18 with me and see what he said. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Nobody did anything to Jesus that he didn't willingly allow to happen. He was in charge all of the time. He was ruling and reigning even as he was submitting himself to the point of death. Jesus said this verse in John 10 when he was talking about the good shepherd, and it's a reminder to me of the shepherding of Jesus. But I want to remind you there are two shepherds that are depicted so clearly in the Bible, one becoming a foreshadow of the other. David was a good shepherd, and we've been talking about the story of David and how much of the life of David portrays uh, what Jesus would go through. But I want to remind you, both David and Jesus were born in Bethlehem. Both knew what it was to be a skillful and good shepherd. David's penning that great psalm, Psalm 23, in which he talks about what a good shepherd looks like. Both spent much time in the wilderness alone with God. Both had servant hearts and were chosen by God to shepherd his people and both protected and defended the flock of God against the enemy. Both were good shepherds in their own right. In fact, this is what's said of David in Psalm 78, 70 through 72. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. Remember David picturing the shepherding of Christ. But as we consider Christ as shepherd, I want you to see and be reminded 
that Christ's shepherding was foreshadowed when the shepherds announced his birth in Bethlehem and then was evident throughout his ministry. He fed 5,000 wandering sheep in the wilderness. He bound up the broken sheep. He left the 99 to find the one lost sheep who was stuck in a tree. That was Zacchaeus. When the shepherd was struck at his arrest, the sheep scattered as all his disciples fled. While bad shepherds of Israel mocked and sought his murder, Jesus, the good shepherd, laid down his life for his sheep. And that's what he had come to do. Well, as time went by, David ceased to be a worthy shepherd and became a wandering sheep as he sinned, committing adultery and murder in the incident with Bathsheba. And at that time, Christ's wooden rod and staff would already be ordained to take the form of a cross as he took upon himself David's wandering and ours. Did you know that rod and staff, two different pieces of wood, two different lengths of wood, and how perfectly they form a cross used together to guard and to guide. And I am thankful today for the willing Lamb of God who was a good shepherd and came to lay down his life for the sheep. The second thing that I want you to see today is again a tale of two crowns. We've been weaving the story of David with the story of Jesus as we have woven other stories of the Old Testament with the story of Jesus. But nothing is more poignant in picture than what happened to David as a result of the discipline of the Lord after the sin of Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet had told David, your household will be struck as a result of this. And it's interesting when David repents uh, the Lord tells him, you will not be judged for this, but there will be harsh discipline. And I want to remind you in your life as a believer, you will not come under the judgment of God, but you will suffer the consequences of sin, just as we all do. Why not judgment? Because Christ will be the one who will take that judgment upon himself. But let me remind you again of this story that we're looking at so carefully. Judgment for David's sin with Bathsheba came through the death of two sons, and then Absalom's rebellion that sent David fleeing Jerusalem to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. And this story within a story presents in striking detail over three days, which pictures the suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of God's Son, following chronologically the Gospel accounts. You can read this in 2 Samuel 15 through 2 Samuel 20. And as we look at it in close a uh, contrast today, I want you to see again just several things about this story of David coming to terms with his sin with Bathsheba. First, I want you to see there are two innocent lambs. We think of Christ as the innocent lamb, and he was, but there's an innocent lamb in the story of David and how Nathan approached him. Do you remember when David wouldn't admit his sin, God sent Nathan the prophet with the story of a rich man who took a pet lamb from a poor family to feast on. You can read that account in 2 Samuel 12. In that story, David says, I am not willing for an innocent lamb to die. He was so angered at what this rich man did. And Nathan turned to David and said, you are the man. Later though, Jesus for David and for you and for me would become that lamb saying to us, I am willing to be the innocent lamb who dies and Pilate cries out, behold the man. We see again these two stories laid in cross section. There are two Kidron crossings. Both David and Christ crossed the Kidron Valley. This is the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. This valley called the Valley of Judgment one bearing the judgment of his own sin, one who will bear the judgment of the world's sin. Both David and Christ crossed the Kidron Brook at the bottom of this valley, which carried the sewage of the city away and flowed with the blood of temple sacrifices, a reminder of the sewage of sin and the blood required to wash us clean. In fact, if you were in Jerusalem for the time of Passover and you looked back from the Kidron Valley to the Temple Mount, you would see a pipe coming out of the wall of the temple where they would flush the blood of the lambs with water coming out of that pipe to run into the Kidron Brook. 
Josephus tells us 365,000 lambs slaughtered at one of the Passovers near the death of Christ. That's how much blood flowed in the streets of Jerusalem. Can you imagine seeing blood and water flowing out of that pipe and remind us again of what Christ would do in his final moments of life when through his death of a piercing in his heart, blood and water would flow. What an incredible picture. And when Christ crossed this brook several times, uh, going to the Garden of Gethsemane and then having to come back after his arrest, getting on his robe, the sewage of the city, the blood of the lamb, the water of, of the Lord cleansing that would bring salvation through him. What an incredible picture, these two Kidron crossings. There are two surrenders in this story within a story. In the Garden of Gethsemane, both David and Christ surrender their wills to God's will in carrying the effects of sin. In David's story, a follower of David lunges at an enemy to take off his head, having drawn his sword because the enemy is uh, chastising, is cursing David, and the follower thinks it's disrespectful. And David tells him to put away his sword, to stop the attack, basically saying, I am willing to carry the consequences of my sin. In fact, when Shammai does this in Gethsemane, David turns and says, let him curse. Let him curse. God has chosen. Perhaps God will be gracious to me. Does that remind you of anything in the story of Jesus? Because when the enemy came to arrest Jesus, Peter lunges at the enemy to take off his head. Christ says, put away your sword. I am willing to carry the consequences of your sin. Other snapshots from the story of David, they're profound. If you read these five chapters in 2 Samuel, look at some of these things and you'll see clearly. As Ahithophel betrayed David, then hanged himself. So Judas betrayed Jesus, then hanged himself. As David, weakened by the load he carried, received help from three men bringing provisions, so Jesus was weakened by the load he carried and received help from Simon the Cyrene. As two sons of David were thieves and died, Amnon stole his sister by rape, Absalom stole his father's throne, so there were two thieves who died on crosses next to Jesus. As Absalom died hanging on a tree, his head caught in thorny branches, so Christ died hanging on a tree with head crowned with thorny branches. As Absalom did not die until three spears pierced his heart, so Christ did not die until a spear pierced his heart. You can't make this wow. stuff up. Wow. Like this is embedded in the story, a result of David's sin. And you see Christ so clearly. Only God can write a word that embeds the story of his son on every single page in some way. How astounding that you and I have it today. And we have already been reminded, you know, as believers in Christ today, here in America, we are so blessed to have the word of God in our hands. So many of our brothers and sisters around the world do not have this. We are even more blessed to be able to sit together and open it. Amen. And I pray that we will take it in and not take it for granted. Amen. The last thing in David's story, as Christ was buried in a tomb with a stone covering, Absalom had been buried in a pit with a stone covering, again foreshadowing the burial of Jesus. Intricate, intimate pictures, snapshots of salvation, but even more than snapshots, signposts. But I want you to see one more signature that bears the Heavenly Father's broken heart. I want you to see a picture from the Old Testament that I think is there just because God wanted somebody to understand what it would be like for him to give his only begotten son for us. In the offering of Isaac on Mount Moriah, God the Father shares with Abraham, his friend, what it will feel like as a father when he offers his son Jesus on Mount Moriah for us all. I want you to look again with me at Genesis 22. And when you think of it in those terms, I want you to listen carefully to the wording of these few verses. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. 
Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Do you realize now, three-day journey, mm -hmm. Christ will go on a three-day journey. Mm -hmm. Both Isaac and Christ are offered on Mount Moriah, specifically the same mountain. God has his friend Abraham journey all the way to that mountain to experience this. Let's keep going. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them went on together. Don't doubt for a minute that God the Father was not alongside Christ as he made that walk. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb? For the burnt offering. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Can you hear it? Can you hear one father walking with the other father, friend to friend, feeling what God will feel. And God himself yes. provided a ram mm -hmm. whose head was caught mm -hmm. in a thicket crowned with thorns. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is the first time the word love appears in the scriptures. The love of the father for the son. And this is the same love he has for you. Please hear that. God went 22 chapters into Genesis before he allowed the word love to be used. And when he did, it would portray what he would feel toward Christ. But even more than that, what he would feel toward you. Look at what 1 John 3, 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Let's continue in the story of Christ going to the cross because there are more twos. There are two crowds condemning, Jews and Gentiles. Do you realize that many Jews today blame the Gentiles for the death of Christ? Many Gentiles blame the Jews. I want to remind you today that all have sinned. All are condemned. All crucified the Lamb of Sacrifice. So let's look at it to see. In Gethsemane, a Roman cohort of 600 men and Jewish temple guards arrest Christ, united against Jesus. At court, the Sadducees and Pharisees, who couldn't get along any other time, united in their plot to kill Jesus. Luke tells us Pilate, a Roman, and Herod, a Jew, became friends the day they united against Jesus. There were three Jewish or religious trials for Jesus, followed by three Gentile or civil trials for Jesus, totaling six trials, the scriptural number signifying man, as Jesus took upon himself man's full judgment mm -hmm. for sin. Mm -hmm. We all, two crowds together, condemned Jesus. And scripture tells us that as a lamb led to slaughter, so he did not open his mouth never defending himself against all accusations as Christ prepared to atone or cover our sin. Now, when we think of the word atonement, we know it means covering, and we think of it as covering our sin. But remember, I've been teaching you that Hebrew is an alphanumeric language, but originally it was a pictographic language like hieroglyphics. It had pictures that went with each letter. When you consider the word atonement in Hebrew, C.J. Lovick says this, The picture of atonement is a prince or judge covering his mouth with his own hand, choosing not to pass judgment on the accused. Mm -hmm. 
Why, as a sheep led to slaughter, did he not open his mouth? Because he, as the one who would atone for us, covered his mouth so that he would not speak what was the truth. And that was that we were the ones who were accused, not him. We were the ones who were guilty, not him. And he takes it as two crowds condemn the whole wide world. But did you know there are two sets of beatings? When we think about Christ being beaten, mostly we think about the flogging. But this is profound to me and I want you to see it. Jews and Gentiles beat the Son of God twice over for a total of four beatings. God's number in scripture signifying the whole world. The temple guard beat Jesus originally, even before he came before the Sanhedrin. It says that the temple guard beat him repeatedly, fists in the face. Then he met with the Sanhedrin, who blindfolded him, struck him, and said, Prophesy, prophesy, son of God, who struck you. He went to Pilate and went through that brutal flogging that absolutely flayed his body open. And if you know the Roman flogging, you'll know this wasn't just his back. His legs were laid open. His arms were laid open. Every part of him was laid open. It was a miracle that he did not die in that very place, completely flayed, and we'll see in a minute why. And then Roman soldiers, after that flaying, put a robe upon him and mocked him and beat him again, putting that crown of thorns on his head. And then it says, beat his head with rods. Can you imagine having a crown of thorns placed on your head and then rods beaten over your head? Four beatings, four times, representing all of us. And as if it wasn't enough, the first hand to strike King Jesus was a Jewish leader calling him out for not properly addressing a human high priest. The mockery that he went over is unbelievable. Roman hands placed a royal robe on Jesus, crowned him with thorns, then placed a reed scepter in his hand, a sign of brokenness and weakness, mocking his kingly authority. And he took it all, becoming the atoning sacrifice. Christ was beaten beyond recognition by all of us. Isaiah 53 says it this way, bearing our griefs, carrying our sorrows, by his stripes, we are healed. Feel deeply with me today the words God includes to describe the suffering of his son in Isaiah 53. Despised, rejected, oppressed, not esteemed, afflicted, wounded, crushed, pierced, familiar with pain, punished, stricken by God, led away in judgment, cut off from the land of the living. That's a lot of words. That could have been summarized in a much shorter way. And yet God leaves the record of this for all of us to see. Bruce Marciano was a changed man by portraying Christ, but he was particularly changed by having been made up as the crucified Christ. And then hanging on a cross for nine hours on one day, of shooting. He says of that experience, I hung on the cross yesterday. This was in his diary. More when I had the time, but simply I never began to understand what Jesus did for me until yesterday. And I still gained only a glimpse of the reality, the absolute subjection, submission to horror for me. Every believer should wear a crown of thorns and hang on a cross for 10 seconds. They would never be the same. And I can't help but feel that every non-believer would accept Jesus on the spot if he did the same. I've never felt so alone, so naked, so ugly, so emotionally bare. And I was just play acting, dipping my toe into the experience of the cross. What he did for us, he chose it. He talks about putting on the makeup and walking through the town. And he said the people didn't know what to do. He said first the clerk at the desk wanted to call for help, wanted medical help for him. They ran toward him to help him. They ran away from him, from the horror of it. He said he couldn't understand the cross until he felt all of those things. What an incredible experience that he went through. And this is what he says about the cross. 
We're talking about the single moment every letter and comma in the word turns on. Everything that went before leads up to it and everything afterward flows out of it. It's the single most tremendous release of power and glory in all of history. A moment that single-handedly holds the universe from being ripped apart like a dirty old rag. It's a moment of such incomprehensible magnitude. It alone pays the penalty for every single wrong, every war and mass murder to every stolen pencil in universal history from day one on. The cross changes everything. I'm struck by his experience hanging on that cross for nine hours. And I'm reminded again of how that changed him and also of what he said about it. Every one of us should hang on the cross for just 10 seconds with a crown of thorns. And yet he did it willingly, the willing lamb for you and for me. The second thing that we want to look at today is the work of the lamb. Remember, he was the lamb from beginning to end. John even, John the Baptist, describes him this way initially. Look at John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We should never be very far from understanding that. And in order to understand it, we need to know there are two Passovers, not just one in the scripture. Picturing the first Passover in Egypt and the Feast of Passover every year thereafter to celebrate, Jesus enters Jerusalem as God's Passover lamb shares his last Passover supper with his disciples, explaining to them it was all about him, and then is slain as the Passover lamb, being flayed open, bled out, then consumed as he felt hell's fire. This, by the way, a picture to the side of an actual lamb who has been flayed and is being roasted and prepared for Passover. Notice that the fathers, after killing the lamb, would carry that lamb on a crossbar that looks just like a cross in order to bleed it out because there can't be any blood left. And then they open it up onto that crossbar and that lamb is roasted in the fires. Jesus experienced all of that. Do you know why he was on a cross that way? Because he was the Passover lamb. Do you know why he was flayed open in the flogging? Because he was the Passover lamb. Bled out from Pilate's courts all the way to the cross, roasted in hell's fire. Lamentations 1.13 tells us he felt the fire of hell's judgment in what he gave for us. Why? Because he was the Passover lamb. And when we apply his blood to the doorposts of our lives, we escape the death we deserve. And the death angel passes over us because the wings of the Lord Jesus Christ hung on a cross enfold us and his blood covers us. There are two elements to the Passover meal that are poignant, the bread and the wine. This is what is so fascinating to me and I want you to see today. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Ephratah, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, Mike, Micah 5, 2 tells us. Bethlehem literally means the house of bread, signifying his body. Ephratah from Peri, the word Christ spoke over the wine signifies his blood. And Rabbi Jonathan Kahn gives us this background. The place where Messiah first appeared in flesh and blood bears the names of the two elements that represented his flesh and blood, Bethlehem Ephratah, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Even in the place he was born, we foresee the foreshadowing of the Passover lamb who will give his body and his blood in covering us and giving us life. And then we see two gardens in the crucifixion of Jesus. The first is the king's garden. That is the garden of Herod's palace. Herod's palace was right on this side of Jerusalem, and every king has a garden, and Herod put in a five-acre garden in his palace. Christ would come to this palace and be judged several times by Pilate, who was in this same palace by Herod and then by Pilate again. The three civil trials took place in the king's garden. Where were Adam and Eve judged? In the king's garden. This place filled with beautiful fountains, seating for hundreds of guests in Herod's courtyards. This is where Jesus would be judged by Herod Antipas and Pilate as God judged Adam and Eve for their sin in the garden. So we have two gardens, 
Herod's garden and the garden where Christ will be crucified, which has two possible locations, both of which are a garden, one right here outside of Herod's palace and one farther away, the one that we usually think of when we think of Jesus, where the garden tomb is. Another garden, the garden of death to life. Remember what John 19, 41 says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. A place created for commemorating death became a garden of everlasting life as Christ was resurrected on Easter and Eden was restored. What a beautiful picture the Lord laid for us there. And sometimes we miss it because not knowing Jerusalem, not knowing the lay of the land, I never knew until I studied this, that Pilate judged Christ in the palace gardens. Isn't that incredible that God would again weave these things so carefully together? And then I want you to see there are two cross bearers. While Christ bears his cross personally, Simon thy Cyrene bears it prominently. This again, I have never seen in the story until I studied it this way this week. Each of us deserve to bear our own cross. Did you know that three gospels only name Simon the Cyrene as carrying the cross of Christ? Only one account in four gospels literally says that Christ carried his own cross. The other three say Simon the Cyrene carried the cross. Why is that important? Because the cross is ours. It's everything we deserved. And Simon the Cyrene carried it on all of our behalf, but only so far, because only Christ could actually be the true cross bearer. Think of it though, Simon the Cyrene, Simon, a Jewish name, Cyrene in Africa, a Gentile location, Jew and Gentile in one, carrying the cross. Christ though carries it for us, fulfilling every sacrifice. And I've taught this in our tabernacle and feast studies, but I want you to hear it again. Jesus fulfills every offering in Leviticus 1 through 5. All of the offerings that are offered in the tabernacle and temple, Jesus will fulfill perfectly in order in every detail. The sin offering, he was wounded for our transgressions, sprinkling that blood seven times around the base of the cross. Again, I've told you, why did he suffer so much? Why did the bleeding start so early on that day? Why did he bleed out? Seven sites of bleeding, his head, his hands, his feet, his side, all the ways that Jesus bled, the flogging, seven times sprinkling his perfect blood as the sin offering. He was the guilt offering. He was crushed for our iniquities or our guilt, Isaiah says. This is why Barabbas was let free even though he was guilty. This is why Judas, having betrayed Jesus uh, in his guilt, could have changed and come to Christ because Christ would become the guilt offering for him. Christ was the peace offering. Isaiah goes on to say the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The chastisement, the punishment, the spanking. He took our spanking. That was our discipline, the scourging. He became the Passover lamb. By his stripes, we are healed. And that is the gift of life. And I want to remind you today that we will never taste death's sting. But we are instead living sacrifices, Paul says in Romans 12. And there are only two sacrifices I could find in the New Testament that you and I get to offer to the Lord. The first is a sacrifice of praise in Hebrews 13, 15, and the other is drink offerings of service poured out. Paul talks about in Philippians 2, 17. Why this picture? Because this is me holding up the cross as a little girl that I bear. Compared to Christ's cross, this is nothing. If you think you're sacrificing somehow for the Lord, I want to remind you that the only two sacrifices you will ever bring to him are sacrifice of praise and a life poured out as a drink offering in service to the Lord. What a privilege it is for us to do that. And so the Lord tells us, take up our cross and follow. 
Do you know what I find fascinating about those events and what the Gospels say about Simon the Cyrene? In all three Gospels, it says that Simon the Cyrene took up the cross, but Christ led in front of him. He followed carrying the cross. And that's what you and I do. So my question today is, will you be a living sacrifice of praise and poured out service to the Lord? That is a great takeaway from this lesson. And then I want you to see there are two thieves, two thieves who die, two stray lambs dying on either side of the Lamb of God. Both had their legs broken, a symbol of the strength of man broken, as well as a disqualified sacrifice for sin, as a lamb could not be offered if it had a broken leg. Hear those things clearly today. Two stray lambs who died as thieves because they robbed from God ultimately in sin with their legs broken. There is no way that you and I can earn our salvation. Why? Because we don't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Christ is the only one who can do that. And Ken Geyer rightly says, the cross, like a set of scales silhouetted against the Jerusalem sky, stands where all humanity has been weighed and found wanting. There Jesus hangs with outstretched arms, aching for a prodigal world's return. On either side hang two thieves, teetering between life and death, between heaven and hell. Do you realize that the thief on the cross did nothing to earn eternal life, but look to Jesus to live. I will never forget when my oldest daughter, Michelle, came to Christ. I may have related this story to you before, but I'm going to say it again because it is so poignant to me when I come to the cross. We had taken her to a passion play at one of our largest churches here in Phoenix that every Easter puts on the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord. She was three. She sat on the end of the row. She couldn't wait to see the story that she had heard about. And Jesus, riding the donkey, came down the center aisle, our aisle. And when the donkey came to Michelle, the donkey stopped. And Christ turned and smiled at her. And then the donkey continued and Christ went on to the stage and died on the cross and my little lamb could not take her eyes off of him. She didn't move a stitch for the rest of the evening. And when we left that auditorium, we had to buy a VHS tape, because that's what they were in that day, <laughs> of the passion play as it had happened, because Jesus saw her. Jesus, riding in on the donkey, stopped and smiled at her. Jesus knew her. And when we got home that night, she said to us, I, I want him. I, I want to ask Jesus to be my savior. And we being the good parents we were said, oh, honey, you know what? We, will, we have some things to talk about. We want to make sure let's go to bed and sleep. And then, and then we can talk about it in the morning. She was three and a half. Mm -hmm. To David and I, it was, it was too soon. We wanted her to be able to fully appreciate and identify and, and receive Christ for all that he had done for her. That next morning, she came bounding down the stairs into the kitchen and simply said to Daddy and Mommy, I went ahead without you guys. <laughs> and do you know what? That child never looked back in her faith. And to this day, I can't imagine what it feels like for her to remember that moment when Jesus stopped and looked at her. The dying thief on the cross felt Jesus look at him. And he looked to Jesus to live. Jesus lowering himself as a willing lamb, doing the work of the lamb. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And that's the last thing I want us to see today, the worthy lamb. Look at what Revelation 5, 12 says, because as we gaze on him, that is what we are going to find out, that Christ is the one who is worthy and we can look to him and live. Revelation 5, 12 says, In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. There will be two pronouncements at this cross that I think are so phenomenal. 
The first is the King of the Jews. The title King of the Jews was used twice in Christ's lifetime, both times by Gentiles, at his birth by kings from the east and at his death by a Roman governor. In fact, the Jews were angry with Pilate for putting that sign over Jesus' head that said the King of the Jews. They said, you have to change that. It has to say he said he was the King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. The King of the Jews. I love that. The second pronouncement, the Son of God. This was spoken by the Roman centurion at Christ's crucifixion as he witnessed the worthy Lamb of God die. Max Lucado says it this way. He turned and looked around at the rocks that had fallen and the sky that had blackened. He turned and watched as the eyes of Jesus lifted and looked toward home. Surely this man was the son of God. Had the centurion not said it, the rocks would have, as would have the angels, the stars, even the demons. But he did say it. It fell to a nameless foreigner to state what they all knew. God the Father made sure his son was respectfully recognized from start to finish. While a Jewish king tried to kill baby Jesus and God's people said at Christ's death, we have no king but Caesar. Gentiles bowed before the king of kings. John 1, 11 through 12 explains that to us. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you know that my PowerPoint has stopped working on this slide? And this is what the Lord has asked us to dwell on today. And this is what we will see as we finish up. Because worthy is the lamb that was slain. And we said we would come and sit at this hill and so as we sit here and Christ is crucified, I want you to see that there were two sets of signs that God brought that were supernatural to again speak volumes about the worth of the lamb. Look at what Luke 23, 44 says. It was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole world until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining. Matthew 27, 50 through 52 said, and when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Do you know we never talk about this in the story? No. Dead men walking. We never talk about this. I want to talk about this. And we'll talk about this more next week. How astounding. I want you to clearly see there were two earthly signs. The first, an earthquake. Isn't it interesting when rebuked for being praised by his followers as king at his triumphal entry, Christ responded to the religious leaders. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As God's people kept quiet, the earth quaked its praise to the king of grace and glory. The second earthly sign, and darkness. Just as the last two plagues in Egypt were three days of total darkness followed by the death of the firstborn son, leading to the salvation of all people under the blood of the lamb, so the last moments on the cross were veiled in three hours of total darkness and the death of God's firstborn son, leading to the salvation for all people under the blood of the lamb. Did you know that? The last two plagues repeated twice. Again, foreshadowing what Christ would do for us. And did you know that the darkness reached all the way to Egypt when Christ died, where the historian Dionysus writes, either the God of nature is suffering or the machine of the world is tumbling into ruin. God left a historical signpost of that darkness all the way to Egypt when Christ died as Passover lamb. And then there were two eternal signs. The first the veil in the temple torn in two from top to bottom, from heaven to earth, opening access to the holiness of heaven through Christ. And the second eternal sign, graves opened and bodies raised, the immediate effect of the canceling of the curse of death. And then the last thing I want you to see as we consider how worthy is the lamb. 
There are two rich men and two poor men at the death of Christ. Fulfilling what Isaiah 53, 9 says, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. First, two wicked, the thieves on the cross, dying in moral and physical poverty. When you died a crucifixion, the Romans took you off that cross and threw you on a dung heap that was nearby in the Valley of Hinnom, which was a picture of hell, and you died there, uncovered, completely exposed, and the birds ate your remains. They died in abject poverty, and Christ was there at that place. And yet it says that with the rich in his death, two rich who were there at the time, finding spiritual treasure in Christ. Now consider this, the religious leaders of Jerusalem, the Jews, were incredibly rich. Mostly the Sadducees who lived in Jerusalem made up the Sanhedrin. They had mansions right next to Herod's palace. They were wealthy nobility. And now two of them will come to the cross to honor their king, to take him down, to prepare him for burial. Nicodemus, the one who came tentatively by night, will now bring treasures in broad daylight, an offering for a king. One pound of common spices is what burial preparations required, and most Jewish households kept this on hand. But the Bible tells us Nicodemus brings 75 pounds worth of costly spices, myrrh and aloes, which is sandalwood. And if any of you have tried to buy myrrh or sandalwood today, you will know how expensive it is. The amount used to bury royalty. Estimated worth today, $150,000 to $200,000. The price of a house is what Nicodemus brought, not by night, by day, to honor the king of kings. And then Joseph of Arimathea, who gave Christ the treasure of a family tomb, which could never be used again. Why? Because Jewish law said that bones can't be mixed with bones. Family can't be mixed with family. Your DNA has to be the same in that tomb. And even though it becomes a family tomb, it has to be that DNA. Well, nobody would ever fulfill the DNA of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And there's an empty tomb today that has been an empty tomb for 2,000 years because Christ only needed not a rented room, but a rented tomb for three days. And when he came out and it was empty, it's empty still. Isn't that an incredible snapshot of the Lord, an incredible signature of salvation for us? And I want to remind you, in poverty, in riches, assigned with the wicked, but then esteemed as king of kings. Remember what 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So my questions as we close today, do you truly know the riches of his grace? And can you see the treasure of the cross more clearly now? I invited you at the beginning of this message to sit on this hill with me, to gather at the cross, as those Moroccans gathered at the cross when they were shooting the film, The Gospel According to St. Matthew. As you have sat on this hill in these last moments, can you see him? Can you see the Savior more clearly? Do you see what compelled him, the motivation to love you and to show you the full extent of his love? Look at the lamb and live. Understand he was the willing lamb. He was the lamb who did the work. You can't earn it. You only receive it. And he is worthy to be praised. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and riches and blessing. May we give that to him. God promised me when we began this study together, that wonder would await. And I pray today that you have been able to view Jesus and to wonder at the grace, at the love, at the humility, 
at the at the incredible willingness to give his worth to you because that's what he has done. You are a child of God if you have looked to him on this hill and lived. And if you haven't, I want you to know the only thing you have to do is exactly what that thief did. He simply said two things. He turned to the other thief and he said, we deserve what we're getting. But this man has done nothing wrong. You identify that you deserve that cross. You identify that Christ was perfect and had no business being there except to pay your price. And then you turn to Christ and you say, Lord, King, remember me. Know me. Receive me when you come into your kingdom. That's it. Like Michelle, you don't need anybody there with you. You don't need to pray a prayer. You don't need to say any particular words. You need to know that he is the Lamb of God, and you need to look to him and live. I pray that's true in every one of your lives, and I pray that if you have looked to him and live, that you will look to him every day, that you will never look at the cross the same way again, that you will take it with you, that you will take up your cross and follow, and the only thing you have to do in response to him is give him a sacrifice of praise and be poured out in loving service to your King of Kings. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for what you have done. I am overwhelmed with your willingness. Your work stands out so clearly to us today as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Father, he is worthy to be exalted and seated now at your right hand. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Father, may we give him with our lives all that is due him. And may our lips be filled with the sacrifice of praise. And as we pour out our hearts in loving service, may you see that small service as our taking up our cross and following after the one who took up our cross and carried it all the way to a hill and did what we could not do. The lamb of God who did not die of broken legs, but a broken heart for all of us. Father, may we worship and adore until we can do that in person before your throne. In Jesus' name.